Hello and welcome to Box the Talk. I am Shekhar Gupta on this very sunny and beautiful daily afternoon. Such a sunny, beautiful winter afternoon that I can take my jacket off and fold my sleeves. And Geeta, it doesn't matter to you. You come from Cambridge, yes. Harvard. Geeta Gopinath, Professor Geepa, Geeta Gopinath, welcome to Walk the Talk. Thank uh, you. You come to India often enough. Uh, and you spend a lot of the time in the rest of the world, not just Harvard. So as we come into the new year, give us Geeta Gopinath's view of the global economy. So we're going, to, we're going to see some very interesting trends starting uh, 2017. This might be the end of secular stagnation, something that has been thrown around for the last two years. I think you spell it years. out in India. If you say it's the end of secular stagnation, people will start applauding, thinking it means something else. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is... In the, in the advanced <laughs> economies, and especially in the U.S., we've had periods They've of very low now. growth. They've right. been stagnating, their growth rates have been low, their interest rates have been very low. And there's been the sense that they would be stuck in this particular low growth trap for uh, the foreseeable future. But 2017 could be the turning point because we've seen some big changes that's happened in the developed world, biggest one of which is Trump's uh, election win. Uh, and so we might actually for the first time see investments in infrastructure, which is something that the U.S. has needed to do for a while. We've already seen interest rates going up. So that would be the first thing. Anytime we think phone signals are bad in India, we think of the U.S. <laughs> the, the other big uh, event that we all have to wait and watch and see what happens is the growth in, of populism in most parts of the advanced world. As elections come around in France and in Germany, we're going to see whether there's going to be a shift more towards parties that are populist, home-driven, anti-globalization, and that could be another big trend that could, uh, we, we could see coming around in the next year. A third trend is the commodity exporters might finally see some relief with an upturn in commodity prices. And so starting we could see oil. parts, starting with oil. And so we could see parts of the world that have been hit hard, like Brazil and Colombia, uh, with the high commodity price, with the, sorry, with the big drop in commodity prices, that they actually get some respite from it. And Russia. And Russia, yes, of course. But at the same time, parts of the world which have benefited from low commodity prices, like India, getting hit? So you will have a reversal in that trend. I mean, India has, uh, you know, had this big gain in terms of low commodity prices. So that gain will certainly come to an end. I do not expect commodity prices to go back up to the, you know, the $100 a barrel level because we've had now many competing forms of energy supply right, right. that are putting, would put a, you know, an upper bound, starting with shale, and, there's, and these have become far more cost effective in producing. Uh, and so, you know, we could see the price going up, but it's not going to go back up to the, uh, you know, the very high levels of four or five years ago. So, uh, are you bullish or bearish at the beginning of the year? It depends on the part of the globe. Are you going to, it's very hard to say something kind of, you know, for the globe as a whole. America? For America, I would say I'm, I'm bullish. I mean, in the sense of there could be, we could see higher growth rates than the 2% growth rates we've seen. Whether that's good in, for the long run of the economy, I'm, I'm skeptical about that. But you can certainly see, uh, you, would see you could see higher growth. Because this will be expenditure driven. Government will spend money. The government will spend money. The government decides to cut back on, cut down on corporate taxes and does a major corporate tax reform. That could stimulate private investment, which has been quite weak in the U.S. for the last several years. And so there seems to be many pieces of the momentum shifting towards growth uh, in the U.S., higher growth. In the U.S. Uh, and what happens in India? I'm bringing you right back to your from your adopted home yes. to your original home. So with, with India, I would say that the first six months of the year would, would I mean, it's, it's going to be, you know, India is growing at seven odd percent. With the demonetization and its impact that's going to play out over the next six months, it will slow down. So if you look at the, the, the pieces of GDP growth, if you look at investment, investment has been weak in India, it was weak prior to demonetization. I don't see anything that will change that in the next six months. If you look at consumption, 
Consumption has been hit by demonetization, so that is a negative hit. So two of the, two of the important pieces of GDP. Uh, I mean, there's nothing right now that we know of that's going to stimulate it. Now, demonetization could eventually benefit the economy, you know, six months past or one year ahead. Uh, but, but nothing that tells me right now that there's a nice spark in the economy. Uh, so how could demonetization benefit the economy six months from now or one year ahead? Let's look at positive positive side first. Yes, so on the, I mean, the positive side is the, is you know, the new narrative, which is that we move towards a uh, less cash-driven economy. There's more money in the banking system that hopefully gets allocated appropriately. Uh, there is a, I mean, for me, actually, the bigger uh, event that will be positive for India is the GST. If that actually gets implemented, which it should like, by uh, before September, that would be a big piece of it. So for demonetization, I think the biggest plus is the shift away from a cash-driven economy to a cashless economy. Maybe more parts of the informal economy become formal. But everything we know on, the tra on this transition process is that it's a slow one. So I don't think we can expect anything to happen very quickly. Has it worked anywhere in the past? Is there a precedent or is this truly unprecedented if this works? This is. This particular implementation is truly unprecedented in the sense of getting rid of 86% of the currency in circulation overnight is truly unprecedented. And it's not unprecedented in terms of practice, right. it's also unprecedented in terms of theory. Because pretty much every single macroeconomist colleague of mine who I've spoken to would say that this is something that we probably would not recommend to any developing country. Let even an advanced economy, you wouldn't do that. I mean, Ken Rogoff has written a book on it, says that... Although he's a supporter of less cash. He is an absolute supporter. I am a supporter of less cash. Yes. I, you can find most macroeconomists who would be supporter of less cash. You who worked be, with Rogoff. I worked with Rogoff. He was my advisor he's and he's teacher, my colleague yes. right now. Right. You, everybody supports getting towards a cashless world. Everybody supports getting rid of high denomination notes. Everybody supports getting rid of black money. But this particular implementation is really quite unique. So it's, in one sense, it's going to be interesting. And you know, we will learn a lot to see how this plays out. So here is a counter question. What do you economists know? Because you get everything wrong. I'm giving you a counter view. Uh, you were not able to predict the downturn of 2008, the big, great global crisis. Uh, you did not see oil prices falling. Probably you did not see oil prices recovering now or maybe you did i don't know but it looks like the economists never get anything right now uh, so how do you trust global macroeconomists on their view of india which is so unique that two-thirds of direct taxes are stolen and a third of indirect taxes are stolen is this your view or are you channeling somebody else okay? I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 I i am i am reflecting someone someone's view but I, that that's that's one side's view it's an important side's view Okay, I, so firstly, it's incorrect to say that economists did not predict uh, the 2008 crisis. You will find economists who did speak about the possibility, including Nuriel. Raghuram Rajin, and, and, including and, 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 and Nuriel Rubini. Rubini yes. So that so there was there was plenty of suggestions that this could uh, this could happen. Secondly, I mean, if you want to think about it. The Great Recession in 2008, the one that comes close to it was the Great Depression in 1929. Right. So if you go through uh, a long period of time when you haven't had a major crisis, I mean, it's impossible to say you're going to predict every single yeah. crisis every single time. So it was after eight decades. It was, exactly. It was after eight decades. And right. you never get praised for getting all the things right, but you get the blame right. for not predicting the one thing that happened eight right. years later. So I'm not good. And, and Whatever said and none, it is going to be impossible to predict with 100% accuracy. I mean, we don't predict the weather with 100% accuracy. We can't predict the way the economy is going to function with 100% accuracy. So I'm not, I'm not going to be defensive about this, that particular line of argument that uh, you know, economists have trouble uh, predicting the future. I mean, there, you, you make uh, uh, you know, an intelligent uh, argument around it, but sometimes you will get it wrong. But there is the Bhagwati school which is not a, uh, not a lightweight school, which seems to be fully behind this. Do you take it seriously? They are it's, economists? It's, it is Bhagwati's opinion. I mean, he, uh, 
he's entitled to his opinion and he takes this, uh, uh, he has a particular view on demonetization and he's but, certainly open to holding it. But do you agree with this? Uh, I personally do not think that this style of implementation was the way to have done it. I'm fully in support of the idea of getting rid of high denomination notes, but doing this gradually over time would have been a much better approach than doing this overnight. And let's think about what was gained by doing it overnight. I mean, the whole point of doing it overnight was that a significant fraction of these old notes would not come back into the banking system because right. it would be too hard to right. recycle. Right. That has not been accomplished. And they will be floating in the river. And they will be floating in the rivers, they will be burned somewhere. But that hasn't happened. So if that wasn't accomplished, then why not have done this much more gradually? And you could have had the same benefits without the immense costs. The other uh, argument is, uh, and I am being, uh, I am being a journalist for a, uh, not an opinion based, not an opinion writer for a moment. Another argument is that Indians are addicted to cash. That unless you arm twisted them like this, they were never going to change their habits. Uh, you can, you can argue for why it's important to do a particular policy, but you have to look at the cost and you have to look at the benefits. I mean, you can, you and I can agree, you know, that it's very important to be for people to use toilets, but you can't force them to, to go toilets. and defecate outside. Right. I mean, not to defecate, no, not outside. To defecate outside. You yeah. can't do that, and so you have to. You can give incentives for behavioral change, you, like, like, like is being done right now, which is providing you know, cash-based incentives for people to, to use digital payment methods. And you can do all of that, but you can't force people to switch very quickly. And, and again, while there can be benefits to doing this, the questions are the costs, and the costs are big.